But that attitude, attitude. attitude. But that attitude is going to mess it up. Vic's not confident well, it's, in his uh, uh, podcast n- intro. No, it's because I, I – so my, my microphone was picking up my fan because it's hotter than – it's so hot in Texas, the Mexicans oh. are let me, let me tell you. <laughs> so that's, Vic, that's why I had to turn it off, and I'm just like, oh, man. So bad. Vic right can now. say that since he's Mexican. Uh, I can. Yeah. Yeah. That wouldn't go so well Tex-Mex. for me. I would never say such a horrible thing. I mean, you could. You could. What's it? I, I would laugh. I feel like it's hot everywhere. Oh, we're in Austin. Yeah, Austin's rad, and it's a, but it's a billion degrees here, and it's just absolutely horribly. I think we're like we're we've literally had over a month of triple digits every day, just scorching, yeah. disgusting, ridiculous heat. But I think it's like hitting the whole country right now. What's it like in Nashville? I mean, it's it's definitely hot. We've had some triple digit days. I mean, I spent seventeen years in Houston, so I'm I'm no oh change. god, oh. you poor you poor <laughs> thing. <laughs> Then I, I'm from there, and then I, you know, moved here, and it wasn't so hot for a few years, and then it started getting really hot. So we we get both ends of it, though. We get snow, and we get super heat. Wow. Well, since since uh, since Vic didn't say, we are speaking with Anastasia Elliott today is our guest. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, that that's the intro. We do these li- really weird, uh, unconventional intros, and that's how we Sometimes, kick it off. Yeah. Sometimes we get afraid we're getting a little too professional, and we have to. Yeah, we have to make sure we keep it casual. No professionalism. Anyway, (laughs) snow. I mean, I just need snow a couple of times. You know what's crazy? Remember a couple years ago, we had that freak storm here in Texas, even. It snowed and iced over, and it was insane. That was the craziest thing that's ever happened in this state. But uh, so Nashville and Tennessee in general, I mean, you get a lot of floods. I remember uh, there was some serious flooding there several years back. Um, Do you get a lot of, is there kind of like rain season where you have to deal with a lot of that kind of stuff there? Not really. Honestly, no, like I remember floods kind of being more of a thing in Houston than they are here. I mean, I know oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's right. a good point. Yeah. Yeah. The tornadoes are here. That's something I've never had before. Ah, uh, okay. Like, not, not really in the area that I live in. Um, but yeah, I never, I remember when I moved here and I heard my first tornado siren at like three in the morning and I had no clue what it was. And I was like calling my mom and dad trying to wake them up. Like there are air raid sirens going off and I don't know what this is. So you said you're from Houston, but you ne- moved to Nashville when you were like uh, late teens or something like that, like finishing high school or? Yeah, I moved here by myself um, when I was 16. And oh, wow. I left. So you were calling your mom and dad, like on the phone saying, yeah, mom and dad, phone. what's happening? <laughs> yeah, okay. on the phone, like, I, what is this? Please and being up. from Houston, they were just like, uh, is it heat? Is it a flood? Well, we don't know. Those are the two. That's it. <laughs> Hurricanes. <laughs> What part of Houston are were you from? Um, Memorial Gallery area. That sounds kind of familiar. I remember being as a kid and like going into Houston and the gallery was like a cool thing. Like the yeah, mall that's or a mic. Cool yeah. And that's about we went there and, and back in my small town days when I started we had we went there for Guitar Center. It was like a huge and yeah. Toys R Us. Like every <laughs> everything we ever did that was cool involved Houston because it was the closest big city that had all the cool stuff that we didn't. Mm-hmm. Block, blockbuster video. Mm-hmm. Blockbuster video, yeah, you know. I still go to Blockbuster <laughs> I, Video in I Houston. I do love the, the culture of Houston. Nashville's not quite caught up in food and museum culture and, like, you know, things. Really? To I would have thought, thought they would have been. <laughs> I thought they would have had some pretty good food. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 There, there is a couple good places, but it's definitely, I would not call Nashville a food city yet. I mean, it's it's... It's growing every year, but it's still not quite there. Definitely not Austin or Houston or New York. It's nowhere near those places. Texas does have some... We we know what's up with food around here. We have yeah, guts to prove it, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. So, Nashville, I'm assuming, is did music take you there? Was that... Did you move there yeah, following that passion? Or? Yeah, I spent my junior year of high school mostly traveling between New York, Nashville, and L.A. writing. And out of all three cities, I loved the co-writing here the most. Um, the songwriters, well, when I first started writing here, there wasn't really hardly any eclectic pop coming out of Nashville. So I was bringing all these like big country writers into weird pop sessions, and they're just hmm. such brilliant storytellers. And I'm way more of a music melody heavy writer. And I love working mm-hmm. with people that are just like have gifts with poetry and storytelling. And 
I found that in Nashville. And so I definitely was one of the first of the kind of eclectic pop people to be here. And Good for you. Let's keep that happening. I want to see Nashville get more diversified. That's one great thing about Austin is just so diverse here. Yeah. I think Nashville's clearly one of the... Um, yeah the business Mecca big time, you know, and all those, like, like you said, I always make the joke on the podcast about the, the, the songwriters there and producers that, you know, walk around in lab coats and they have everything down to a science. Cause you know, they're churning out all these co- commercial hits, especially in the country genre, you know, but I feel like Nashville it's a much more business oriented town. Creatively. Like I, when I would go to LA, it would be like, you know, how many songs can we get today? And Nashville was like, how can we get the best song? Even if it takes a week, like, let's make sure. Oh, is amazing and that's what i loved about it here it was it wasn't it didn't feel so corporate in the songwriting um, interesting that's cool to hear wow yeah but now, it, do you it, have certain city, uh, as far as pop and rock go like i still don't feel like there's much of a scene here and we're really trying to do a lot to change that but it's kind of a tough place to be yeah uh, to be based it, it's great for the surrounding cities but it's still Kind of a tough place to be based, not being American or a country. Yes. Uh, now I saw. Um, now you do you have you've worked with different songwriters, different producers. I think you've got some go to guys that looks like you know that you like to collaborate with. But um, are there certain studios that you work out of, uh, like exclusively, or you kind of bounce around and just like working with different people, or is there a method to anything, or just kind of yeah. is it different every time? And it's different every time for this um, first LP. I spent seven years working on it and wrote over 300 songs for it with... Um, oh, my God. ...over the country, giant writers wow. and producers to small writers and producers. And um, when I was ready to record, I co-produced the record with um, one of my long-term collaborators and wanted it to be very, uh, like, one team that was bringing the sound together at the end of it. But um, I tend to write very across the board. I I like mixing it up with different genres and different styles and then producing it to be the sound that I want at the end of it. So I definitely don't shy away from trying anything. (laughs) But I think that's awesome. Interesting stuff. Uh, But I recorded my record at two studios here. Welcome to 1979, which is an old vinyl pressing plant turned studio. And Mm. then um, after we became thoroughly annoyed with that studio, we moved over to Blackbird for the next 17. Oh, famous Blackbird. Yes. Yeah. Most of the record at Blackbird. So the new record, what's the title? La Petite Moore. And that, now is that, it's like about to drop, isn't it? Um, Or am I completely off? In a very different way. So it's a 13-song visual album, and a song and visual will be released every 60 days for a year. Okay. Now, now, so far, you've got a string of singles. Are any of those on the new album? All of them are on the new album. And so that's what you've been doing with the singles Mm -hmm. kind of in that. Okay. And so you Um, pre pandemic, well, we, I just just started releasing the record and then once that all happened, I pushed pause for a second because I wanted to be able to, I mean, spend almost a decade of your life on something. I really wanted to be able to tour it and like support it with shows because live shows are one of my favorite parts. And, um, we didn't know what was going to happen. We just started touring. So we kind of pushed pause on it and, then I was going through some uh, potential deals, and um, now I'm kind of restarting the machine of this record release. But yeah, it's, we're a little we're a little bit into that record now. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. COVID threw a, a, a mild wrench in all of our plans for a good couple of years there. Now we're all sitting there like this, just yeah. please, like, aren't we there? Like festivals and shows and all these things are coming back, and it's super great. But everyone's still getting COVID, but at least there's a vaccine. But now there's monkeypox, and it's just like, for God's sake, can we, are we going to be able to move on with our lives? So, you know, hoping as we all are that uh, that works out for you and that we don't have some other, you know, global setbacks. But, you know. Yeah, if something takes away shows again, I'm just, I don't know what I'll do. <laughs> I'll be very sad. You know, 
Yeah, it's funny because, I mean, I had been playing a fair amount, I guess, at that point, and I was, it wasn't bad. I think some people enjoyed the break a li- in a way, right? Um, of course, I didn't have, I mean, I did miss out on some tours, which I was super, I, there was a tour that would have happened that, that was a super big bummer. And, you know, there was some cool things, and I have a festival that, so I say that like I didn't care, but it, it did mess up a lot of things. And initially, though, there was a little bit of, of time there. It was kind of cool to just go, okay, well, I'll just write and, you know, and be creative around the world, you know, collaborating with people sort of remotely, but at at a certain point, like, yeah, like you said, I mean, this, no matter how much the business, uh, the music business has, has changed and been super topsy turvy, you still can't understate the power of a live show of a great performance, you know, selling merchandise and making fans and meeting people in person in the, in the, you cannot emulate what happens on stage between a performer and a band and a, and the in the crowd. You know, it's just it's magical. So, no, I, I, I feel you on that. I, we had just started touring right before it happened. So we had just I spoke at, I hosted a panel at NAM and we had toured out to LA and Texas and then New York and then we were about to go to Ohio and that's when everything went down and it felt like just like finally being in the place where I was getting to play. Shows. Right, and then the world shuts down. Like, okay, I guess not. And this year we've stayed pretty local so far just because I've been doing so much. We haven't really been able to leave easily. But um, next year, the goal is definitely to be traveling a lot more than we know. Speaking of NAM, I've been to many NAM shows. And uh, that's really cool. You actually had your own panel. I, I saw that you did a NAM interview, but you actually set up something where you were doing a panel on technology and, and, so, and stuff like that. Is that correct? Yeah, I hosted a panel on the future of technology for independent artists. Wow. And this was in 2020 or what? Yes. 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 <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Do you plan on doing that again? Was that, was that something that it, was it, was it, did you enjoy it? I partner cool. with a lot of their company, a tech company, and um, they bring me out to do speaking gigs a lot. I love public speaking. I, I do speeches on, on tech, but also on trauma and mental health. So right. I on my plane crash and all that fun stuff. So there's a, yeah, I love doing public speaking. Okay, hold on. We got a lot. There's a lot to talk about with you. Like, I'm, I got <laughs> yeah. questions floating around in my head. I'm like, don't forget that one. Like, so you just breezed over did i hear the words plane crash what did i just hear so this is your first introduction to stage lines yes Um, well i don't know how i didn't dig that deep if there's i didn't know you were in a plane crash tell us Um, enlighten us i was in a plane crash on my way to finish recording my song crash landing oh my god that's the blueprint and La Petite Mort stands for, it means in French, the little death or orgasm. Uh-huh. And so the entire record is about themes of death. My name also means resurrection. So the whole record is about death and rebirth and kind of working through my own life traumas, but all of the you know, deaths and rebirths that we have in our personal lives. Wow. So yeah, Crash Landing was the, the spark that set it all forward. <laughs> Now, is that just a eerie coincidence that the song was already called Crash Landing, or did you name the song Crash Landing or write it based no, it on that? It called Crash Landing. It was already wow. pretty much done. Um, and the headlines on the news were actually, like, Crash Landing. <laughs> um, it was kind of bizarre. I, I was working on the uh, lyrics on the plane. Um, oh, my gosh. Really, really, really meta. <laughs> Yeah, that's a rock star story right there, and you survived. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. So, was this like a personal type flight? I mean, it wasn't like a. What was, geez, what? When was this? Really? Like, when was this? 2013. I was 18 years old. So, it. Um, oh, my God. It definitely was the thing that made my 18 year old invincible self no longer invincible. I like changed. It changed my life in every way. I started doing every single thing differently. And, um,. It was flight number three, four, five, which I thought was also super weird. So as you like see the videos and stuff, every video has an aerospace theme and they're all interconnected and they, I, I was are- going to ask that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, okay. Well, and we're going to get into your videos. Sorry to cut you off. Keep going. No, you're good. You're good. But, um, yeah, you'll find my little three, four, fives hidden around. <laughs> 
I love that kind of like thing though with an artist that there's there's backstory stuff and there's little little uh, what did they call them? Uh, there's a word References. they use Easter eggs. Easter eggs that you kind of you kind of sprinkle around and, and I <laughs> nice and I love that thread and you're kind of connecting things that's really cool too. Um, hey, back to shows real quick because I mean you're not touring right now, but I saw that you have a show. I want to say it's August 28th, and God knows if this will be out by then because we don't know. But the uh, the <laughs> the um, it says Queens of the Stone Age tribute. Now, what's up with this? Yeah, we're playing a Queens of the Stone Age tribute night. I'm so excited. I've never done a tribute night before, but um, it's 15 bands. We each get two songs. There's going to be some really um, famous, fun special guests. And uh, yeah, it's going to be something different. Something wow, us. that sounds super cool. I was just listening to that. Uh, what is it? Songs, Songs for the Deaf. Is that the name of the album? Yeah. I, uh, just listening my, to that the my, other day. My two songs this time are The Art of Keeping a Secret and Collapsia. So I okay. some, uh, some fun ones. Nice. Very cool. That's very cool. Um, yeah, it just goes to show your eclectic nature. September 28th is our next show in Nashville. Wait, and, sorry. That's um, that's not that one, but that's your your show. Your August okay. 28th is Queen, I don't know why they're both on the 28th, but uh, all you got to remember if you're national is the 28th. It's do, those, do, those, do those two numbers equal three, four, five? Let's, I don't know. <laughs> some, you, book, you only book on certain dates. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's run. Let's run through your 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 songs because there's enough. There's a, you know you've got a lot going, but it's not like a ton of albums, so we can kind of go song by song. So it looks like the first one you released, at least that's digital on Spotify and all that, is "Love After War," and this one's interesting because it's actually quite different than the other ones, right? You're featuring Panda, I guess, uh, or you guys co-wrote. Song, um, this song was actually a funny one um, because my ex producer was um is the guy in the panda head and they asked me to sing a demo and i did and then they uh just decided to release it without asking me so <laughs> that's the story of that song wow and um i i mean i'm it's fine it's cool the song's fun but i didn't really have anything to do with that song other than lending okay. my, uh, lending my fun vocals <laughs> yeah because it is certainly a I mean, the other ones are all diverse in their own right, and you got some great covers and everything that you put your spin on. But that one is definitely the one where it's like, oh wow, this is totally left field, you know. Yeah, that, that was a, a, a fun demo that was released. <laughs> Interesting. And in the same year, the boy who cried love. Tell us about that yes. one. That song. Um, well, before that song, I was signing to the president of Capitol Records, and we. We're like almost done with our deal, and then they got a new CEO, and my president wound up leaving and going to head Warner, and he couldn't bring me to Warner because they had a non-compete clause, but he couldn't finish anything he started over there for a year, and so I decided to spend that year really like building up the bulk of my because I knew I wanted him I, I wanted to sign to him I didn't really want anybody else so I just kept writing and getting things ready and this was one song that I built out during that time and it was more for it was my first time ever mar marriaging music to visuals because I we chose this song because of our video idea and the uh, visual for that one is pretty crazy um there's no CGI in that video, which watching it, it looks like there is, but there is not. It was, um, okay. Since you're on that, you know what? Let's go check this video out. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. My dress comes to life and eats a guy. <laughs> and it's so impressive because hold on. What? But that, but that was my first time really getting, um, the taste of what is possible visually, because for me as a songwriter, I write, in a very visual way. Like, like I said, I'm not super a words person. And so when I'm writing melodies and in music, I see videos and visuals first, and then I kind of describe that to get to my lyrics. And this was my first taste at getting to see just what's possible. And then the videos just got bigger and bigger since then, but it's still my first and I still love it. <laughs> So a few things about this. Wow. I mean, your visuals are really great. And like you said, you, you make your own costumes 
you really have a sense of aesthetically what you want happening in these things. This is you're very hands on. Like a lot of artists, I think that's a whole nother realm, right? You write the music, you're act, you're you know, you're big in the studio. I feel like that's my comfort space. And outside of that, I'm a little like rely on others, you know. And I might have some direction, but you you seem like you're very very. You know exactly what you want in that department. Absolutely. I, I just this week I just finished. I just wrapped three music videos. I just directed and. Oh wow! Holy crap! I'm excited for. I'm excited for those to see the world. Yes, I love meeting uh, music video directors too. <laughs> Back to my point about having about, about having no direction. Yeah. No. I mean, these look so good. Yeah, these videos look so good, like so clean. I yeah, mean, and just I mean, really a hundred percent professional. Video, uh, the boy who cried love. The bottom half of me is actually um, recreated on a Barbie doll, and we put her in a six foot water tank and pushed current through her with an egg dropper and um, acted in reverse sometimes. And wow. We. Uh, so that is uh, no CGI. It's just, um, it's just all practical then. Uh, oh. Very, very big on everything needing to happen in camera and as practical as possible. Um, there are a few VFX shots in my videos, but we really try to keep it as practical as possible. I just wow. think it feels more real. And I don't know. I just like it. Like it probably shows my age but i'm so for that because i look at like these old movies the original star wars and that kind of like honestly the, the original star wars movies and stuff that were made in the late 70s or early 80s look a billion times better than that stuff that came out in the late 90s early 2000s that cgi is like laughable i mean it's embarrassing yeah. you know so i think i think like you're dealing timeless they look very timeless and the right. art director that did that video with me and uh, bunch of them actually london and caution as well uh jonathan paris he's like the king of practical effects like he builds miniatures he does all kinds of cool stuff so how much of that video these videos and that, props to you for i mean this stuff looks absolutely stellar and i think it looks better than i mean cgi and all this computer stuff has gotten really great but i'm personally i just you know i to me it's like it's the content right and the the you know i mean i know there's like it's super big and everything on superhero movies but when you're everything is just based on cgi and the plot is secondary it's like that to me is kind of like eh, you know i'm not that impressed by that so well that i i think that makes it even more impressive that you are um how what did you call it Vic? <laughs> what's the word you use what, practical practical yes. i guess yeah yeah um, and so Practical how much, fix. how much yeah. post, how much post is involved in this stuff? Is there still a lot of posts though? Yeah. Mm -hmm. As I said, sometimes it's maybe not so practical, but. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, we've, we've had some guests where we kind of have kind of, and we've got this a little more recently. I've really had some guests with some fantastic music videos. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and these are like among the best I've seen. Like, I'm just like, wow, man. So, um, cool. Also, this song, personally, The Boy You Cried Love, I really like this. It's just kind of got an intimate quality about it. I love the piano. I love the way it starts. There's kind of the, the dark, intimate quality about it. I really, really dig this song. I'm a, I'm a classical pianist and opera singer, so this song, for me, was a great one to come out the gate with because it just kind of got to... I, I know it's a strange lead single. I mean, obviously, it's a ballad, and it's weird and it's dark and it's operatic but i i feel like it really kind of showed kind of the core of what's underneath all the bells and whistles yeah i love it yeah it's interesting because it's like you didn't come out with the big pop hit or the cover those came later <laughs> and uh but you came out with this I, this song is great I, I actually think for whatever reason it might have just been random or something that i think that's the first song i heard uh from you and i was like oh wow like i really really dug it um okay let's see Cigarettes and gasoline. What's up with this tune? Actually, there's a story here, right? Uh, uh, and public speaking might be involved in this one. I think there's a story behind this. What is what's going on with this tune? Um, cigarettes and gasoline is the, I could call it the prologue. Is kind of the, uh, it wasn't on the record. And then when I wound up taking my album from Warner Brothers and becoming independent, I wanted to kind of have a track that, it, it was one that I had wished was on the record so i finished it and i put it first and it was 
to me kind of the beginning of the entire story. So, um, yeah, it's, it's story about toxic relationships and I get to kill, I get to kill this man many times in my video in many different ways. Oh, and if only real life could work that way with no consequences. Right? Uh, so that's your... <laughs> Like, that's basically your dateline story <laughs> cool all right uh we'll put a disclaimer on this podcast uh let's see is, i'm looking to see if there's is there a video there's videos for all these right yeah here, well no that's a promo oh there it is no cigarettes was one of oh there we go it was one of my um, my biggest and actually my cheapest. I this was the first one that I really like went crazy for designing the costumes. I've collaborated with a lot of fabulous designers and um, got to use this old historic home before it got renovated. And there was a lot of really cool fun stuff that happened in that video, <laughs> including uh, the, the room with a red chair was covered in vulture shit and like that was the vulture's nest so we had to like make sure that the vultures didn't come to the house when we were filming <laughs> but it was also um 30 degrees when we were filming and i didn't feel my toes for about eight hours there is my real blood in that video from where i cut myself on sugar bottles when i smashed them on my head they have all kinds of like artistic sacrifice in this oh. I, I have come to say, if there's not extreme uncomfortability or pain for me in a music video, I didn't go hard enough. Every video right, has a story of extreme, uh, like extreme hardship. <laughs> but this one, all of the uh, like the footage that is not in the video, like you can see, like the brim of my hat just like shaking, and I'm like shivering. And <laughs> they're like, "All right, three, two, one," and I like breathe and then still myself and. And do this, but you can see like there there are touches where you can like see my breath in the air, and it was freezing, and it was freezing, and the scene where my hair gets wet at the end, it was and it was night, it was extra freezing. <laughs> that was an uncomfortable day. Wow, it, you shot all this in a day. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's right. impressive. That was, that was a day and a half. Wow, time, yeah. I'm skimming through as you're talking about it, and um. I'd have to really pay attention to know just how uncomfortable you are, but I do see the vulture shit yeah. and, uh, and the blood, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, man, these videos look amazing. I, this one's mm -hmm. got 660,000 plus plays, but wow. I mean, I'm really, really floored with your, with your visuals here. And I was reading about that, I think on your bio and you know, the, uh, you as an artist and a songwriter, but also with, you know, equally important are the visuals and, and the storytelling and everything. And clearly, you immediately see that in the videos. A song I release that doesn't have a video, if I'm being honest, like it just doesn't feel complete to me because I, I write it all together and it's very mm -hmm. cohesive to me. Like I, I, the thought of not getting to make videos makes me sad. So I've learned that's, how to do it on a budget. <laughs> that's amazing. It really is. And these look, I mean, on a budget, I would look at this stuff and go, wow, this is not cheap at all because it looks fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I think so many bands like myself included just stumbled around and did it all wrong. It's like, look, we're, we have a band and we're going to go play shows nowhere near ready and then putting out an album and then put it doing And then like finally years later, I'm like, maybe I should make a music video. <laughs> it's like, no, this is a visual world. It's mega important. Everyone, huh? has, their method. Everyone has their method. It's, it's just, I mean, all, all of these are like serious blood, sweat and tears to pull them off on a budget. Like it is weeks of sleepless nights and lots of donated work from friends and you know it's it's pulling off little miracles <laughs> but i are think you most... stumble upon them they maybe think oh these are big budget and these are paid for and they are truly all diy wow i think that's actually super encouraging for artists to hear and i and that you're doing that i think it because sometimes i think you feel like oh you can't do anything at a, a super professional level without spending you know a zillion dollars to do it so it's really really impressive that this stuff is diy in absolutely no way whatsoever looks diy it looks so so incredibly pro uh, do you shoot most of these so. marketing and i'm going to get to you on that we are going to this is why 
I, well, the whole reason I know about you and I, I was like, oh, we got to get her on the podcast was because I saw Kaylee Rose's, I'm, my band's also in that, the Out of Tune documentary. And I mean, I love what, you know, I know some of the people she interviewed and there were other people that, I, that I've heard of. And then I, I absolutely love what you said about vanity metrics. Vanity metrics, what a great phrase, because you're so right. But at the same time, it's like, you have to do it, right? You can't, I mean, marketing has always existed. It's not like it's a new concept, but the problem now is, you know, it's like you might create the greatest art in the world. It doesn't matter if you don't market it. And the problem is you're marketing alongside people with dog shit that are, might be putting equal or more amounts of money into it. And that's, yeah. So I really appreciated what you, what you said in, in regards to that. Oh, do tell. <laughs> comes out on August 10th, and I'm so excited, and I love this song so much, and it's just trying, you know, it's always the gamble of trying to figure out what is worth the spend, what company is actually worth the spend, and who is totally full of shit, because most of them are, right. and, and I'm not even talking about, like, you know, the quote-unquote playlisting companies, I'm talking about legit agencies, marketing agencies, mm. that will take yeah. $3,000 a month, and yep. just kind deliver a little but like not enough to right cost, and you get you don't get that back and they love to say you know give us three months to like really get you going and i'm like cool so like twelve thousand dollars plus ad spent and it's just like it gets exhausting and it's kind of i i really hate the kind of hamster wheel that's been created for artists yes. now that like, you need to have all of and, and it's and it's true, and I don't care who who the hell you are telling me that numbers don't matter because they do. They matter. Absolutely. And I, even, yep. You know, with London, we had some great streaming success with London, and we worked really hard on that. Um, but it was funny to watch, like, you know, a second my monthly listeners got to like, you know, over twenty thousand for the month and then people were like, "Wow, like you're really gaining success," and I'm like, "That's so fascinating because like." cool like spotify numbers are great and like hopefully that helps with some things but like i don't know who those people are i can't retarget those people like i just marketed you know a bunch of stuff to this place that like you can't capture leads and i feel like music marketing has really become a place like no other business or type of business would function in this way where basically marketing is capturing leads or just generating leads like you're getting your views on spotify your views on youtube and then like there's no way to actually capture them and that's not the focus of any of these agencies is not really an roi or you know building funnels that actually fund your career and to be able to continue it it's just let's get your views up and then it's like great i just did that and i spent all this money doing that and now what <laughs> even pr yeah. like it's awesome but like you know getting in publications is great it's great for your seo and it's great for your bio but like how many real fans are you generating from an article it's not yeah yeah i think yeah. it's uh that's the the, the the thing about it is and i think it as you climb that ladder as a musician you know depending you know some people come from the very bottom with no real uh you know support group or or knowledge and then you're you're kind of just you know grinding it out and learning on your own and other people might have you know a camp in the beginning that's a, that gives you a little bit of a help but i think at every level right there's just the bottom level is just nothing but sharks that are just trying to grab your money and i've we all know all a million spam emails a day of just absolute bullshit sharks then you get to that higher level, right? And you're 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 trying to like, okay, what's the right publicist? What's the right PR? Let's do this. Let's build a portfolio EPK, which is a, at least seems a little more viable, right? And I think there's some great publicists out there, obviously, but but like you said, it's like turning that into actual uh, fans these days seems so incredibly difficult because I think everyone is so. I mean, once upon a time there were, uh, you know, there were. I don't know. There were just bands and genres and, and it was more funneled and more direct. And they came from these, the bigger, you know, uh, uh, labels and this kind of stuff. And so we all kind of knew what the, what the deal was and who those artists were. And then you pick and chose your favorites and you would go buy those print, those publications and all this. And now it's just this like sea of overwhelmingness. So you're competing against everybody and it's, yeah, I don't know. And I think a lot of people feel that like, like, how do you crack this code? Like, where do you put your money? You obviously have to market, but 
what's the smartest way to do that? And to your point, um, just dealing with, um, I'm trying to think, um, if I don't think it was a booking agency. It wasn't, it was something, uh, but yeah, I know the thing about the old, uh, yeah, give us X amount of money retainer and we'll do X, Y, and Z. And then you see like you know, half a Z, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, and you're just like, hmm. Thinking, um, marketing strategy and like how I approach that. I, I really look at like the London be organic for a bit. I didn't put any advertising into it and I just kind of wanted to see what it would do. To see. Time. Yeah. I, I learned a lot of good stuff and it also helped me with like expectations because I've always kind of been the person that wanted a million things in line. So that really say was really big and awesome. And this last time I just kind of let it be what it was and let it grow and, and didn't freak out when <laughs> or at least there wasn't a huge explosion. And I'm, I'm trying to adopt that a bit more and to market way less for vanity metrics and more for yeah. engagement because it's not sustainable. And I don't think it is the way anymore. And yeah, it's, marketing in this day and age is hard and, and TikTok, you know, that's, that's a hard thing too. I'm still not really, um, I don't really understand it. I'm really trying to understand it, but <laughs> I also think it's difficult because there's just oh, so I much to love, keep up with. I love making long content. I love making music videos. I love making things that are like party and tangible. And I have a hard time with the, Oh, I need to be interesting in three seconds. And my value has to happen in three seconds. I like building stories and and it's hard in this day and age when it's like it's so fast and, and I'm learning I'm I'm trying to learn how to uh, kind of take what I do and package it that way and bring the people over. So Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it's like uh you're casting a net, right? And you're just, that's all these different social media, all this, and you're trying to cast a net and bring back anything. But it's like, where's the smartest place to do that? And how, how many nets can you cast? Like how, how much time does a person have, you know? And like you, you start to see why all these roles exist and these machines for these high level artists, because it is just yeah. not one full-time job. It is multiple full-time jobs, you know, having, having been very like high up at a label for a bit and then being independent with a small team and then independent with no team and now independent with a small team. I feel like I've seen marketing and creation through every kind of level that you could. And so that has built my semi-cynical but curious attitude towards marketing. Cool. I'm gonna do a con- I'm gonna do a consultation call with you after the podcast. Like, oh, absolutely. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Let me pick your brain. <laughs> and also, how much for a music Mar- video? <laughs> marketing and music direct. Yeah. <laughs> video direction, right? <laughs> cool. I my the entire rest of my year is booked up, but I'm flying out to Nashville in 2023. Hey, are they still? Do they have a Nam show there at all this year? I don't think they did, right? Because it was so weird, and they had the. Were you out? Of, did you go to Nam this year at the in um, Anaheim? I didn't. I didn't it was go in this June. year. June. Hopefully, fingers crossed. We've got something potentially really exciting in the works for next year. So awesome! Yeah, I should. I should be there. Um, now the the LA Nam that's is different than the Nashville one, right? Yeah. Or I guess I mean it's the same, but it's I guess it's just way more industry yeah, specific. Just way yeah. bigger, way bigger. Yeah. That's like yeah. the one they tried bringing it to Austin for a couple of years, and that's actually how I got my foot in the door. You know, like that's where I met Tragen Guitars and some people, and and that opened it to <laughs> getting out there. But um, but I think Austin pretty pretty much flopped. It was so small. I, I love networking and I love conferences, and I will meet everyone there is to meet. So I really love going to things like that. I. I will tell you, um, so my whole thing, right? I mean, I've performed at several NAMs um, with like Tragen Guitars, Godan Guitars, and stuff like that. But like, I'm, and I'm a Godan sponsor girl. Are you really? I love Godan. Oh my God, that's so cool. I love I, Godan. I actually have a really funny story about them. Um, so, this guitar, this guitar, yeah. um, my mom got me when I was in like sixth grade. I really wanted an electric guitar. It's beautiful guitar right here. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Apparently all kinds of really cool capabilities. Um, so I'm a pianist, not a guitarist, and I'm learning. I'm learning how to be a guitarist, but, you know, piano is my main instrument. So I really wanted an electric guitar, 
And my mom gets me this guitar for Christmas. I went into the guitar center to get like some accessories for it. And I saw this thing on the wall and it was a really expensive guitar. And I was like, mom, what the heck? Like, I just needed like a starter guitar. Like, why did you spend this much? And she was like, I didn't spend that much. And they literally mistagged this guitar. And she got like a $1,200 guitar for like $300. Holy and shit. So when I was about to start touring, my old manager actually reached out to them and they like kind of sponsored me. And it was really funny though, because I'm like, I'm a pianist and my first sponsorship is guitar. So um, I have three guitars now from the, I have two acoustics and that one. And I am now really trying to be diligent about getting better at guitar. Awesome. Yeah. That's in your prologue video for, uh, sorry, Scott. No, go ahead. Yeah, right. Cigarettes and gasoline, the prologue. Yeah, it's the one you're playing strumming on. Yeah, great company. They've been, with me, it's like the first acoustic guitar I ever got was a Siegel guitar. And for years, I've been teaching music for years and years, and I have several um, Siegels and Kodans. And, and I would always be like, oh, bang for the, you know, starter people yeah. asking about what kind of guitar. Bang for the buck. These are the best. I've, they're always, you know fantastic and then at some point a few years ago i was like man i've sold a lot of their guitars i should really reach out to them and i just got set up with a great you know happened to get really lucky with a rep and they've just been fantastic i hit them at the we just happened to be walking by their booth at right before closing time at this last name and they were having a 50th anniversary celebration i think it was 50 or bir a celebration or something for the company of the and the, the original ceo who's now retired was there and so we all just got to hang out after hours in the convention center and having a little having a little party and everything but uh, really 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 cool so i definitely um yeah they sound so beautiful um but anyway um nam shows where videos you were going through the videos and then i no i'm gonna go back i'll go back we this is we tangent on this podcast yeah there's no dead space here because i'm yeah. constantly excited i'm like <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I want to. We, yeah. We, no, here's the thing, though. Like, we, we, go ahead, go ahead, Vic. <laughs> I was gonna say we 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 talk about it beforehand. We're like, yeah, okay, we're gonna do this. We're gonna ask these questions, and then we just kind of just like boop, split. Yeah, I'm yeah, way yeah. I'm way too ADD but to I, follow a format. Yeah, it's, it's way more dynamic that way, though. So I wanted to say something before we come back to the videos. When you, the reason I started going off on Nam's show stuff is because of what you said. What my point was, as I played in the past in my early Nam shows, I was all caught up in the like, oh my gosh, rock stars and getting the sick, you know, doing. And it's fun and it's an experience. But this last Nam was much smaller, and I made it a point to like go. I want to go see some panels. Like you said, I hadn't done a, nearly enough of that, that I, in the past, and I so thoroughly enjoyed that. And I got to see these great legendary producers like Matt Wallace and Sylvia Massey and stuff like this. So it was, uh, yeah, that this is, this is, uh, this is how, you know, you're getting more mature, Vic. Like, I'm not like, I'm like, I gonna, I went and it's so good. West, uh, this past year and I went to every single panel I possibly could. I can't huh? Okay. The shows and um it was great because south bay was at like 50 percent capacity and what it usually is and so right people in the panels and i met so many incredible connections mm -hmm. with people just from talking to them and saying hi and it was fascinating to me how at the end of like panel discussions so many people would just leave and they wouldn't even try to talk to people out. I know that's the whole thing. And I feel, I think that's the cool thing about that kind of stuff. Cause I was, you know, I finally got all over my childhood shyness fear, you know, and it's like, you're just like, go talk to this person, man. You know, Hey, it's great to hear you speak. And I, that was, you know, and I'm a, a fan and then you, you know, you make connections, you meet people, you never know where things are going to lead. Right. And uh, whether it's, yeah. And then you could just be like, that person's a dick for the rest of your life. <laughs> but the whole the whole South by thing, that's another thing I used to, uh, I, not official showcases, but I used to always play a bunch of, like, a lot of awesome musicians play, play, play as much as you can during South by because every bar is a venue and the whole city's, you know. And then nowadays, it's like, uh, you know, I'm not so interested in that anymore unless I got, like, an official thing or something, but, but, 
you know, we, I saw you had an interview with Top Shelf and uh, Kaylee had introduced us to Top Shelf Music and that we actually got um, press badges and everything for South by. So if that happens in, again next year, you, Vic and I might have to just go down, go down there and set up shop and do some uh, in person interviews. I really hope we can, actually. I hope everything works yeah. out. Yeah. And is that, so it's like they, just that big, there's like that one, they have like a, a dedicated, building or something where they just have all the interviews is that kind of how that works uh, or something okay um yeah it really depends on who you're setting it up with but yeah they have a they have a nice press tent area right now how, have you been to austin much in the past maybe when you were a kid right did you travel around much when you were younger or have you been to austin no, much I, no no Houston? Well, sometimes, like, I grew up thinking Austin sucked. That's what I was always taught. And then... Um, I thought it was just time, a dump. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't think there was anything other than UT College and, like, right. you know, party place. And then, 30 years ago, yeah. In the past Pretty much. years, um, I learned to really like Austin. And I'm like, why did you keep this for me my whole life, parents? Um, but... Austin for like a while and so we've been back we went to Levitation Fest, we went to South Bay we've been a couple times together in the past year. Who, I'm sorry, who did you say lives in Austin? Derek lived in Austin Oh Derek, okay, gotcha We have been back a couple of times for festivals and he'll, we'll go to Austin any, any chance we get Yeah, awesome, well for sure if you're ever performing here or coming through let us know, you know Definitely Back to your music. It looks like the next one up is a. I know I didn't know this. This is some of these I recognized, and I was like, okay, I know that's a, a cover song. This one I didn't know, and I looked, and it's a George Michael song. Last Christmas, is that correct? Yeah. How about that? I like the album artwork for this too. It's just kind of goofy and cute. It's cool. First Christmas cover. That one was really fun. Yeah, it's a cool song. Um, we wrapped my my studio basement in wrapping paper and made a really kitschy fun video for that. Um, Alphastasia is my Christmas alter ego that comes out every Christmas. Oh, every Christmas. So you have yes. something planned, something planned already for this come, upcoming one? We are working on that. Alphastasia is, uh, is working on that. <laughs> Alphastasia. Man, you're so on top of it. You've got it all. Oh, I'm looking for this video now. Where is this thing? Yeah, I'm watching it. <laughs> it, it kicks off like the, uh, the oh, gosh, what's the uh, Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer, right? The stop-motion animation, yeah. <laughs> it was kind of uh, annoying trying to figure out how to uh, keep the wallpaper from having hot spots because the wrapping paper was so shiny, so we had to use very minimal lighting for that video because there was just, like, bright spots on the wall. But I, I was like, I don't know, that adds to the kitschy funness of it. So in this one, who's, who's the other dude jamming with you? Oh, you got a band. You got a full band with Christmas tree suits. Like, this is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Um, and my you German made all these clothes, right? You made all this? No, those, no, those, oh. those, no. Those wow. came from that online. I did not have time for that, but, <laughs> but I found them. Um, the, my main drummer from that video is still with me, but um, the other two are not. They were, they were my first, my first band members. Are these guys you toured with? Um, the guitarist, he, he did our first tour with us. And now we uh, now we have a new guitar, and so it's the three of us. All uh, are they all in Nashville? Is all your band located in the same city or no? Yeah, we're all here. That's cool. Okay, let's see. What's up next, Vic? What do we got? What's the next one? Are you on Spotify? Crash. Um, crash landing. Oh well, we already got. <laughs> <laughs> we got the story. Well, we didn't really get the story on that. We got the uh, the irony of uh, yeah. of how that song got finished, I guess. But what was the initial uh, spark for that song? You know, it's kind of I, I've learned about myself over many years of doing this. I don't always know 
what I'm writing about or why I'm doing it. And I kind of just let it happen. And this is one of those instances. And I, analyzing my work now, years down the line, there are quite a few songs that I was writing and didn't really know why. But if I look back at my life, then I'm like, oh, that's what I was, you know, subconsciously writing about or this wound up happening to me after I wrote it. And I think that that song, maybe somehow spiritually, I was just like a little bit foreshadowing. I don't really know. I I manifested that, (laughs) but I don't know why. I don't know why. I just, I just wrote that song and it had no, it was just a visual idea for me and it didn't really have any reason why I chose a plane crash analogy for life. It happened not that long after. Tell us about, so on this video, you're wearing like a space suit and you're in like a, obviously a cockpit. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you film this? What's the, tell us about the set of this. Um, we built this set in a studio here. Um, and this video is a one take. So the performance was very choreographed and there's a lot that's happening that you're not seeing. Um, for instance, when I flip my visor down, I had to reach behind me and turn on a hair dryer that was connected to a tube that went into the space helmet that, um, kept it from fogging up, uh, ah, last interesting. Down. And there's, there's a lot of little things that I am triggering or cueing and the spaceship we made out of so many, <laughs> crazy crafty things there's actually um one of my favorite moments building that set we had ordered um red robin burgers for dinner to the <laughs> to the studio and we were taking a break and um jonathan our art director was looking at the container for his food and he was like save all of these we're gonna wash them and we wound up painting them and they are actually part of the spaceship um, wow. which tells you you can really use anything to make cool stuff. You just got to be crafty. Were you, were you a Hobby Lobby kind of girl when you were younger or what? You're very crafty. <laughs> <laughs> my mom, my mom, and my mom works on all this stuff with me, and, and I so definitely cool. grew up doing a lot of crafts, and I, I hope to get a Joann's or Michael's or Hobby Lobby sponsorship because um, – I do so much with their with their products. <laughs> Seriously, like I would be all like I would say go for that because yeah, I mean it, it's like really impressive. Um, yeah, yeah that, that one was the one thing. It was it was a fun one. Film. How much uh, rehearsal did you have to do? Did you do a lot of dry runs before you shot that, or and why just one take? Just because you it's because it's all flowing, right? And you just kind of had to nail it. I I wanted the first video in the series. Well, I mean, the prologue was the video, but like the first official, first single for the record, I wanted it to be a one take and I wanted the last video on the project to be a one take. And I just kind of wanted that intimacy and realness to be the bookends Mm. for the series. And I think part of it is just the concepts that they, that they tackle. I wanted that to feel unedited and unfiltered. So. And you really do think about you're talking bookends of your whole, you're thinking the whole, I basically show up at the video shoot and go, let's see where it goes. You know, like, I, you know, I man, <laughs> anybody yeah. got a ball gag. Yeah, Vic can, Vic can attest <laughs> the day before we shot a video. I was like, Hey Vic, what are you doing tomorrow? Uh, can you, you want to do a video? Cool. Um, wear a suit. Uh, you're going to wear a pig mask and we'll just see what happens. This is yeah, literally yeah, the information that Vic got. <laughs> By the way, you Vic know. has the greatest villain pig laugh of all time. Just got to put that out there. I do. I do. Yeah. Uh, I, I drive myself and everyone probably a little bit crazy with uh, the amount of intricacies that I require, but it's just, I don't know. That's just how I operate. <laughs> That's how you make great art, though. You know, I mean, it's like uh, think of guy, you know, filmmakers like uh, Tarantino or Kubrick. I mean, I'm sure that all that stuff. I've always been really impressed with a lot of uh, just the dialogue that Tarantino comes up with so fabulous. But he's one of those guys that has had films with very long shots in the rehearsal. I mean, everyone's got to nail it. Every definitely our inspiration. Yes. 
Absolutely. I was I, I can see that 100 percent. The, the 2001 and everything. And I mean, Kubrick, I don't know if you know, he was a, a, a brilliant chess player. Did you know that? And that makes a lot of sense to me because you're thinking so far ahead. And it's the same way. I'm sure when he was making a movie, he had the, every single thing in his head, you know? So oh, yeah. I think. I mean, spending 10 years developing this, this project, um, there are Easter eggs for all of the videos for future videos for things that aren't out yet, all hidden in all these videos. So it's, um, it's all been written and ready to go for a while and just kind of been knocking, knocking pieces over as I go. And so I'm already working on the second and third concept album as we speak. So, of course. Just, you know, just the nature of the game here. Are you, um, I mean, are you equally inspired? Now you're an op, op you know, uh, operatically trained singer of classical piano. I do want to talk about a little bit of that too, but, and you've got, uh, now I'm assuming obviously music has always been a big influence for you since you were young and you grew up that with, you know, with that, but, uh, films and, and stuff like just the visuals, uh, costumes, director. I mean, how much did you pay attention to that stuff? Were you always like super into film or, or where does this video side of you come from? You think it's, I mean, uh, when I was younger, I spent a lot of time at the opera and the symphony and the ballet. Like, my grandfather was very involved in, he was chairman of the opera and was very involved in the boards of all of those things. So I grew up kind of going to to all of those kinds of dramatic and costumed and theatrical performances. And I was always really inspired by how much detail goes into all of that and how much like how you can express things in so many different ways. Like in ballet is you never have any speaking, but they can you know right. show things through costuming and through sets and through motion. And um, I think my theatrical nature definitely comes from that upbringing. As, as I got older, like I'm, I'm not somebody that really listens to music often. Like, um, I honestly never really listened to music until Derek came into my life and started making me playlists and um, playing music around me. And I, I really enjoy it. It's not that I don't. I'm just not somebody. I don't really feel like I'm somebody that seeks out inspiration. I watch a lot of movies. I love fashion, but I don't really approach consuming art for inspiration. When I create, it's just kind of me and myself. And I just mm -hmm. think of, you know, what am I, like, I just let, let the visions come. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like I answered my own question without realizing it. And then when you said it back to me, like opera, duh, you know, <laughs> it's all kind of there. It's all happening at once. I remember like forever, you know, I play guitar, piano, this and that, but I never had been to a symphony. I think I saw, you know, Nutcracker Ballet when I was a kid and then finally saw an opera and a few musicals and stuff in relatively recent years. And I was just floored. I mean, I just had such a huge immediate respect because even if you were like, well, I don't like that kind of music or whatever, it's like, you can't not respect like the, uh, not only is it the music, it's the performer, it's the stamina, the endurance, the costumes, the story. I mean, everything has to flow together. It is really, really mind boggling, impressive. And so that makes a lot of sense how you kind of have with that background. For me, like how I've always experienced music from the time I was little was through the marriage of the visuals, the live show, the costuming and the, and the sound. And so for me, like sound without those elements feels unfinished, yeah. which is unfortunate for my bank account. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think you're doing. I think you're doing well, yourself a service you. because because you've got all these awesome visuals out there, and we live in a very visual world. Like you said, unfortunately, a lot of people can't pay attention to anything, no matter how great it is, if it lasts more than three seconds, and would rather watch mm -hmm. you, you know, eating a Tide Pod than making a great piece of art. But we can't control that, you know. So yeah. you just have to do your art, you know. And I think it'll it'll find its wings that way. And um, yeah. But yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. That's really cool. What are your, um, I'm curious as a pianist myself, do you have any favorite composers, pianists? Um, what, what are some yeah. of your favorite stuff that you love to play? I love really dark pieces. I don't oh, really like, like so heavy, me. <laughs> heavy songs. I used to get really upset in piano lessons when my teacher would want me to play like something happy. I never wanted to practice it. I hated it. But um, I love so are you mo more romantic period than Baroque period, maybe, or? 
Definitely. Yeah. Um, I like Rachmaninoff. There's a lot of Chopin I really like. Certain Beethoven's I love. Um, and I really, I'm really into Philip Glass. It's Interesting. minimalist, but yeah. I went through a Philip Glass phase where I just, I just think it's so beautiful. Um, a friend of mine just gave me a Tchaikovsky book and I, I for my birthday, and I, I've never played Tchaikovsky, but she told me to play this series and it's the sick doll the doll's funeral and then there's like a third a third one but i'm hmm. just so fascinated by what what this is going to be so I, yeah all the guys you mentioned i'm a massive chopin beethoven guy um and i but mm-hmm. and i love the just those russian composers those tchaikovsky yeah. obviously is the most famous but Prok- prokofiev have you listened to much prokofiev mm-hmm. peter and the wolf you know that one you would yes, know it. Yes, yeah. Yes. But he's done some like the Alexander Nevsky soundtrack is one of my like real probably one of my all time favorites. And I always hear so much of his stuff where I'm like, whoa, John Williams loved this guy. Like you could probably hear too, right? A lot of film scores. You're like, mm-hmm. and they were a fan of that guy, right? You hear the, you know, um, I would highly recommend that guy. I think you might like Prokofiev. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot of those very similar influences. It's really funny what you said about the happy stuff, too. Um, I, I always wanted to play Dark and Fast. Like right. Dark and fast. Oh, Dark fast. and Fast. Yeah, well, Chopin sounds good for that, I guess. List. Sometimes those I are guys I, I can't even handle. Rachmaninoff, my God. That's, I, I that's, say, sometimes I wish I had more fingers or, like, bigger fingers. I mean, my hands are really strong from my years of playing, but... No, unfortunately, I don't play as much as I, I used to, and I, I really... I don't know. Most of my life right now is sucked into the unfun part of this, which is like marketing and social media. And yeah, I'm really right. trying to build. I kind of hit a point in this past year where I wasn't really playing much music at all outside of shows and and, and writing sessions, but like never just playing for fun. Mm-hmm. And and Derek actually really called me out on that and was like, "Do you love playing?" And I'm like, "Well, I love doing art. Like I love doing what I do." He's like, yeah, but you love playing. And I'm like, I, I just don't have time for it. And so I'm trying to like build an hour in my schedule every morning where I spend 20 minutes on playing guitar, 20 minutes on piano, and 20 mm-hmm. minutes on voice. So I can start to find joy in the actual act of playing again. Because, you know, like classical pieces and stuff like that, it takes time. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of dedication to keep your chops up. Yep. And it's hard to make time for that when you can think of a million and five other things that you need to do for the business. Industry. Yep. I, yeah. I so relate to that. And then you're, you're, you're busy going like, I, I it's so funny. You got to sometimes pinch yourself and be like, well, wait a minute. I'm actually playing music. Like, mm-hmm. Oh, how and I you almost get jaded. Oh, no, that sounds like fun. And you're like, Oh, grumpy me is like, Oh yeah. Well, it's just a bunch of work, which it is, you know, like, Oh, I got to learn this and I got to polish up this and I got to work on this new thing. And I mean, it's all, it's, it's all this stuff. But like you said, to come back to that place of like, why am I doing any of this in the first place? Because of a love of music. And so for me, I find that so often I got to get out of my own head, just go sit at the piano for 20 minutes. And it's amazing what that does for you to just sit there and, and play a few classical pieces. And, you know, and I'm like, I know I'm not dedicating the time or, you know, to, to that life of like being this really accomplished pianist, but nonetheless, it's still really enjoyable, you know, yeah. having that balance. Yeah. You could do stuff like that. I don't, have you ever, sorry, I'm yapping over you now, but ha, have you ever thought of like doing any classical, like play, like showcasing that aspect of yourself on like a TikTok video or Instagram reel or anything? when I'm there, I'm playing enough to be able to do it enough. It's a kind of like the thing of like, yes, I've, I've put a video or two out, but like to do it consistently enough to have enough pieces to make that like a series, that's, yeah. what, that's what gets fun about it. It's like, okay, you're right. Thing I'm going to do, then it has to become something that's like consistently a series or people, you know, aren't, you know, that's what they want to see on my page now. And then it, then it makes it unfun. So for me, getting back to my classical room mm. and doing that stuff is, it has to just be for me. Even if I post a video of it here and there, like, cool. But I can't do it for the sake of, oh, that could be my TikTok thing. Or it's going to do the opposite of what my intention is. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. I get, the, you know, what's interesting for me is like, uh, I, <laughs> Just the conversation exhausts me. I'm like, oh, TikTok videos. Oh, I, I hate that. I don't like that stuff. I'm, I'm with you. I don't like it at all. I hate that crap. Okay. I was like, okay, I'm gonna do TikTok. I'm gonna start this thing. I'm like, I was gonna do shower singing. 
I was like, okay, my, you know, I need to have like a niche. My thing is going to be showers. Like, great idea. It always sounds great. Like you've got your reverb. I'm going to do like. Vic tried that. Didn't work so well. Like. Yeah, I was on the toilet though. <laughs> Obviously I art direct this to be something way bigger than it needed to be. I found these like type of bubble bath that would make really sturdy bubbles that I could basically clothe myself in these bubbles. And I would make like this Marie Antoinette-esque like hairstyle with my bubbles. And I would make this outfit with my bubbles. It looked really cool. I made like glass beaded bubble necklaces. It, it was cool. So then I'm like, okay, I'm going to start filming these. Like, this is going to be my TikTok thing. It was so terrible because here's me, like, in the shower, cold because I can't really have the water running while I'm wearing bubbles. And so I, like, have the water pointed on my feet. I'm like, okay, do a million takes of this thing because something's wrong. The camera fogged or, like, you know, maybe I didn't, I didn't like it enough. And so I'm, like, spending hours. And then the bubbles would start to slide. And I'd be like, <laughs> shit, that was a good take. But, like... Mm. So that's where your only fans tick to, that's that's where you go the only fans version. <laughs> I'm like I'm combining all of the things for marketability here. You've got yeah. voice, you've got the studio, I'm in the shower and bubbles right. like this right, right. <laughs> No, it was a terrible idea. I lasted for about three days and then I was like, I want to kill myself doing shower TikTok videos. Like this is not my thing. And you know, completely re reassessed. Oh. So well you tried you know you gotta you gotta try you gotta see what works skunk what are what are your favorite tiktok videos well i mean i don't uh, animals you know we all like animals so you know i'd rather watch a panda fall out of a tree and you know and 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 just dumb dumb stuff like that than uh the uh, i i can't keep up with the billions of videos that are out there. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know. And I mean, as a guitar, there's so many, the problem too nowadays, there's so many virtuoso videos, right? Everyone's already done it. Like, okay, cool. I could put myself out there playing a piece, but it's almost more for, for me going like, look, I accomplished this thing and yay for me. And, and maybe some people go, wow, so cool. Yay. And I'm like, I appreciate that. I appreciate every single compliment and comment and like, and all that. I don't think people realize nearly enough how much we, you know, artists actually do appreciate that and how much it actually means. It's huge, more than anything. Like, any of that, like, literally makes my day. Like, I can go from yeah. having a really shitty day of being like, God, I'm just trying so hard and nobody gives a fuck about anything to having a stranger just be like, I love this song. And it'll literally, like, change my mood so much. 100%. Like, you, you're like, you know, you have validation from others. Like, that, no. No. You put so much effort into your art and into your work. It is so awesome to know that people appreciate it and that feedback is important. Mm -hmm. And it's it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, I, I agree. One, one video go viral on TikTok. 2.4 million views. Went super viral. It was like my fifth video. And I was so angry about it because I here's me like trying really hard at all this other stuff. And the video that went viral was literally a video where I... I was getting in the car, Derek and I were on our way to go shoot some photos, and I was about to, like, put the camera on and be like, hey, everybody, we're going to shoot photos. And I, I turned the camera on, Derek didn't know I was filming, and he just, like, takes a really deep breath, and he sighs, and then I pointed the camera to myself, and I copied him, and I wrote text on the screen that was like, when your boyfriend says that he's just breathing, well, this is us just breathing together. Like, I didn't even think it was funny. I was like, is this even content? That's what people always happens. Talking. It's so stupid. People tagging people, commenting, people like, oh my God, this is me. And then tagging their boyfriends. Being, oh, my boyfriend does this. Oh my God, oh my God my boyfriend breathes too. <laughs> and then with how many people tried to diagnose Derek with problems in this Oh my God. Which is cursed. He's got ADHD. Oh no. Maybe if you would stop filming him all the time, you wouldn't hate him so much. That man needs a vacation and a break. Oh my god. This man that you're saying that about is actually my manager, and he wishes I was on TikTok more than I am. So thank you very much. Well, what was, what was, uh, 
what was Derek's thought on this? Because here now you have a viral video, but it really has nothing to do with your music, right? So what is what's the thought process there? We were laughing about it because we just started calling him Psy Guy, and it was really funny because we actually interviewed the this famous musician for one of my personal sessions interviews, and he had actually seen the video on his For You page. Oh wow. I've seen you at the side video, and I was like, "Oh my god!" Seriously? <laughs> and, uh, You're like, "But look at all my art! Look at all the songs and my creations and my costumes!" I'm like, "Oh, aren't you? Aren't you dating Psy Guy?" It's like, but it does get kind of. I, I think it's. I, I mean, I don't know a lot about TikTok, but like, I know that like when you post a video, it sends it to like a small amount of your followers, and then if they engage with it, it sends it out to more people. And I think for me, it's kind of been a tough thing because. I got followers from this thing that had nothing to do with music. And now when I post things about music, like I don't right. know that those people actually give a crap that I'm a musician. So it's kind of in this thing of like, should I start a new account? Like, should I mm. just like did this entire thing? Because that's the irony, don't... right? And it comes back to like, you in a way to the vanity metrics. It's like, you can have all these numbers or something can go totally insanely viral. But at the end of the day, it may not really lead back to any, you know, fans or monetary success. It's just this kind of thing. And the, you know what I think the problem is, is for, for someone like yourself, obviously, who's a musician who's creating art, you know, it's like, that's what you want to push. And then everything else is kind of a means to like, how do I get that mm -hmm. out there? Like, I got to do all these things and try these things. I'm singing in the tub. You're doing all this, right. You're trying all these things, but so many people, they're just like, their only thing now is just like, I just want to go viral. And there's no, mm -hmm. there's no content. You know, there's the, it's just, it could be the dumbest thing ever. And then they're like, I'm famous, but not really, you know, you're not really, you haven't really put anything out in the world. That's like making the world a better yeah. place or moving people or changing yeah. their lives. It's just this momentary thing that was really amusing to a bunch of people on the phone, on the toilet or whatever, you know? And that's like, I, I've that's been researching TikTok this week because um, masquerade, the next single is about kind of, being sick of the fakeness. Of yeah, everything. I was reading about that, and I love. Uh, where did I see that? Was it an interview, or is that on your website? Um, it may, did he send you maybe the press release? I haven't really. No. You know, maybe my Instagram. I don't know. I just maybe. About it. Yeah, I found yeah, something I about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's about wanting people to take their masks off and be real. So I, I spent time this week on TikTok looking up like trends and looking up the things that are popular and just being so appalled by all of the girls that look like brat stalls that are way too young to be getting injections and all the people just like doing the dumbest shit in the world mm -hmm. for attention and following trends and it like really is taking people away from authenticity and like even knowing who they are when they're just constantly trying to copy everyone else so i i'm like I don't know. Maybe I'm about to do a series where I copy and mimic all of these ridiculous videos and make total fun of them. We'll see. We'll see. I know. That's I've thought about... Out of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've thought about so many things too, just parody stuff, and that's part of my nature, that the comedy satirical aspect of my personality that has been implemented in some music <laughs> and stuff. And I've done spoofs and parodies, but I've never really kept up with any of it because it's all so you know, at, at a certain point you really have to go like where does my time have to go? And of course your time has to go to certain places, right? So but you know what's interesting? I was just thinking like, you know, Vic and I are older than you, but I think you're you kind of kind of caught the tail end of the old world, so to speak, where I feel almost you almost feel bad, I think, for a lot of kids nowadays because they I don't think they know necessarily what it's like to just live and be a kid and just yeah. live in the moment. Go play with I your definitely. friends. It's everything is this online vanity metrics. Everything is your numbers and how look, I'm more popular than you bullshit. You know, it's like, come on, man. I'm definitely on the tail end of it. Like, I didn't grow up with that, really. I mean, I wasn't really allowed to have my space and things like that. Like I grew up in, in actual living in the world. Right. And the, and I, the, I the lost imagine. art of living in the world, yeah. living in the well, now. I, I, one of my mom's <laughs> friends brought her 11 year old to visit. And I wound up spending some time with this child who had like, giant fake nails and was on tiktok constantly wanted to go like all she wanted to do in nashville was to go see the um instagram walls of nashville like that oh was god i didn't even know that was a thing <laughs> was, like, i didn't either girl, but, like all she wanted to do was 
TikTok dances and like, you know, show me this mess and like the way she worked that phone, I was like, It's like, you know what I think? We're, it's evolution. We're going to turn into these little golems where we're all just like these hunched over little creatures. Like, and, and then it's going to be the who? They're starting to see this thing in our evolution where people are super into the technology and they're like, oh, this is amazing. You've got to be shitting me. Look this up. It's a thing. Holy it's neck tails. What's it called? Yeah. Neck tails. Oh, neck tails. That's just what I'm calling it. It's, it's a small tail that's coming from the base of the skull to like balance the weight. Like that's where our evolution will head next. Like, I think. I also think pretty soon we're just going to have chips inserted direct. That's the that's the next stage of the iPhone and all that, right? Is they'll just be directly implanted into us, and then we'll like be typing on our hands and doing weird Minority Report shit, and that's just how we're gonna. You know, everything will be virtual reality and all implanted in this. That's why I think it's comical when people, like, worried about being spied on. And I'm like, dude, you've already given all, sold all your information just by having a phone. You know what I mean? But yeah. it is what it is. It's like it's a necessity these days. I, you know, you can't get it. You can't not have a computer and a phone in this era. Positive and a negative. Like, I love Always. how I can connect with people online. Like, I, I don't mean to sound like a granny here that hates social media because, like, I do love getting to connect with people from all over the world. And it's awesome that, like, I can talk to fans in the Netherlands and things right. like that can happen. But I just think that I think what what's bad about it is is that the way that we have to keep up with it, how many times we need to post, like it's it's kind of the schedule of it that's not really in tune with how the creative brain works. Like 100%. our like, creative brain doesn't work in like, you know, how can I make three of the most interesting value driven TikToks today that promotes my music? Like that's just not really how creative people operate, I don't think. And like marketing people that are good at that part are kind of definitely gonna they're taken. They're taken over a bit. It's you know, like you said. It's not so much about the content anymore. It's how good are you at marketing it? So, mm-hmm. people that are good at that part, it's here's your time. It's your time to shine. Bastards. <laughs> No, no, you're 100 percent right. I, so we are going to come back to these other uh, songs and videos, but now that you've let your hair down, so to speak, let's talk about the purple. What's going on with the purple with you? What's symbolic about purple? So much uh, purple. I've, I've been purple my whole career, and then some, and I don't see it ever changing. Um, I will be the granny with purple hair, I think. Um, but, well, it looks fabulous, but why purple? Purple is. The color of the resurrection and nobility, which are my two name meanings. And it's also the color of transformation. It's the color of the crown chakra. It's the color that represents creativity. Um, it's wavelengths are both cool and calming and fiery and passionate being the mixture of red and blue what it is. And so it's a very full spectrum color and for me it just really embodies boldness and creativity and, and all those things my my studio room can't see now but with purple ceiling purple walls purple everything but i've always surrounded myself with purple even when i was a kid my bedroom had purple shot carpet and purple walls and oh wow it's a color that i've always gravitated towards i, I wouldn't even say that it's necessarily my favorite color it's just the color that feels like where I'm supposed to be. So well, when you get to that mega rock star level, you can have like a purple grand piano on stage. Oh, of course. I, I have a, you know, You're like, oh, duh! I already have one. <laughs> Let me show you my purple Steinway. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we really, but no, purple to me, it, it's a it's a frequency to embody. To me, it's boldness and creativity and like introspection and transformation i think the things that it stands for are have always been kind of at the forefront of revolution and personal empowerment so oh by the way and speaking of which like I, your website's awesome and i love just the the design and obviously you've got that color scheme in and everything and also kind of looking at this now and can go into that and something vic mentioned earlier purple sessions so tell us about that what are the purple sessions 
the purple sessions was my answer to everyone wanting me to be on TikTok and make short form content. And I decided to go the opposite route and make an hour and a half long chat. I don't know why that was my answer to it, but I was tired of making content that was making me sad and making me feel burnt out. And I was like, what can I have a lot of fun with? And that for me was, I love having conversations. Like if I could just talk to people about awesome things in their life and, and lean on the cool people that are in my world from musicians to wellness CEOs. And, uh, we could talk about creativity and mental health and all of the things that I'm really passionate about. And so I just kind of started this podcast and it's been so much fun for me to connect with people on all these topics that I, I love and that I hope are inspiring. And, and I kind of, for me was to demystify, I think a lot of the people that we see as, idols and like all, all these you know fabulous musicians and all these wellness gurus and people that like you look at their pages and they look like perfect beings and kind of the feedback i was getting from my own page because i'm not the kind of person that's gonna go cry on social media and be like oh my god life really sucks today i'm gonna put my best foot forward right but that kind of i, I gave a a speech a mental health speech to a, a school and i gained a lot of fans from that and one of them answered one of these positive things that I put in my stories. And he was like, I wish I could have your mindset. Um, you're so positive all the time. And I read this message when I was literally like crying in the laundry room over, probably over marketing. Let's be real. And I was like, I'm doing everyone a disservice by not showing that part of me, but it's not going to come out in crying on social media. Like right. why can't I, I can have conversations with all these people that we feel that way towards and we can talk about our darkest shit and how we've basically used that to turn into our like goal that makes us special and unique. Cause that to me, like my name, I think my parents gave me this name resurrection and I'm now destined for a life of trauma and resurrection because that I, I have so many crazy stories that like, the crazy shit that's happened to me in the past 10 years is enough for many lifetimes. And, but I wouldn't trade any of it. Cause I think that the bad shit that happens to us, if you can learn how to harness that and turn it into what makes you unique and special and creative, like that is where our gold is. So my goal is to show people with this podcast, all the people that, that do that, because I think that's where success really is. Yeah, and in that in that line, like I think uh, that's so it's so cool too. In this day and age, like that's one of the positives I think about the modern world, right? Is podcasting accessibility somewhat to people. Like obviously, you know, and I know it's not as easy as just like you know, I'm gonna you know email so and so direct. You know, you kind of maybe have to jump through a few hoops to get there and whatnot. But you can really like meet and connect with uh, you know rock stars. And they're just people, and they're cool. A lot of them are very cool people. So many people I met back to the NAM thing, right? I mean, I've met people just in at an after party in the airport. You have a great conversation, yeah. become friends. It has nothing to do with business. No one's got an angle. You're just sitting there talking as two people, and that's where like really great relationships often come from. And I think Vic and I both like. I personally just love the podcast for that reason because there's all these people we would have ne maybe even never <laughs> yeah. heard of or talked to or anything, and you get to know them much more intimately than if you were just like, because like you said, everyone, and especially to be fair, when you're when you are um, an artist or something, you know, and it is a business, and so you the putting your best foot forward, it should be treated like that. I mean, no no professional band or or artist is going to be like like you said, crying on you know Instagram and stuff. Like you're you're, it's more about the marketing of that, but behind that is still a person, you know, and if that person, I think most people are, are just people, just normal people, you know, and there's a lot of humility and great qualities. And of course you've got your, your snobby, you know, egotistical assholes out there and everything, but I don't think that's the case for a great deal of people. And it's really cool to see, uh, just in, in, uh, from other podcasts and friends and stuff, just, wow, you interviewed that person and you did this. I saw on yours, uh, you know, Kat Von D and, you know, I mean, it's, um, who all did, so it looks like you're, you don't have a lot of these. Is this, are you, did you just start doing this? How long you've been doing this? Not very long. Um, I think there's eight episodes out, okay. um, but I have more films. I, I had to take a break this past month, uh, just with the filming of the music videos, just cause I was, I just didn't have time to edit right. them and get them ready. So I pushed pause for a second, but I will be restarting it soon. Um, it's one of those 
those things I think right now it's it's for me and I hope that people find it and listen to it and enjoy it um but you know a podcast is just one more thing to market and grow so I'm like yes. this is I I <laughs> this is my answer to a content, but then I'm like, oh, a podcast is even another piece for marketing that I, uh, yeah. So I, I think it's something, it's for me and for people that watch it, and I hope people it. And I think as I continue to spread, I hope people go back and listen to the first episodes because it's, um, it's really fun. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so really cool. Time into researching people, like I researched the crap out of people because I. You hear I that, Vic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First couple, and then I found myself being like, damn. I wish I knew how about that so I could talk about that more. And so I would. I now I spend like a lot of time researching, or like if someone has a book, I read the book before I talk to them. And, oh wow! Yeah. Um, Take notes and one of my favorite interviews that I've done so far is with a happy a celebrity happy coach, Rob Black, who I adore and he's a really book and I learned so much from that uh, interview about happiness and it came at such a great time. It came for me on song release week, which is definitely a time I'm usually panicking. Sure. And it made me so like I don't know. I didn't panic at all. Like I just, I learned so many, so many things from him. So if anyone is watching this and wants to check out my podcast, but it's actually the first episode I would send you to. Awesome. Yeah, we will, so de- cool. we will definitely plug that. That, uh, that name sounds familiar. Yeah. Um, he's a morning show host and he's been in GQ. He's, he's done all kinds of cool things. Um, yeah, he's a, yeah, he's got a great account. He's one of those Instagram accounts, but, Inspired. I tell you, I thank God for that, right? Because there is, we could turn the news on any day of the week or any moment of the day, and it's just negative, terrible war and murder, all this horrible stuff all the time. And just, just, just to have, I think we all desperately need those positive yeah. out, outlets and those, um, th- that, Life you know, inspiration in that Life way. Is hard. There's a lot that sucks, and I think, like, more than ever, media definitely wants to keep us down. And I, I try really hard to limit how much I am consuming that stuff. Like I, mm-hmm. I don't really honestly pay attention to a lot of It's that one stuff good thing about being busy, you know, is that you don't really have time to lay around and watch the news and just get stew on how what a shit show the world is portrayed to be. Of course it is. I mean, there's 7 billion people. It's going to be cra- horrible crap going on all the time, but there's also a lot of great things happening all the time and we need more outlets, I think. And uh, so props to you for, for, um, pushing that for seeking that out for like you were saying that wellness speeches mental talking about mental health i think we need that now more than ever you know or equally for sure because i think and back to the young generation the tiktok the 15 minutes of fame the, the confusion I, I i think so much of that is really just you know just this pressure of this social this unrealistic pressure that comes down from social media and all this numbers and all this kind of stuff and so to just um I think a lot of tragic things happen because of that, because pe- people, especially young people, just don't know how to cope with that pressure and unrealistic expectations. You know, they're like, I a lot of mental health accounts, like wellness style accounts that I follow. Even it's so much like positivity and like, oh, like for for a positive life, like implement these five things into your morning routine, and like mm-hmm. it's a lot of stuff like that. And for me, like when I give. Speeches. I'm like good mental health. Like it has nothing to do with that stuff. Like obviously having a nice morning routine is great, but it can look different every day. Like if you miss your journaling, don't give yourself lashes. Like yeah. I used to be like that, where I was like so militant about my routines and so militant about wellness, and I don't. I wasn't actually being well by doing that. It does. They have and, the opposite effect. Yeah, I, I can yeah, relate to that. And good mental health, like, there's no such thing as achieving good mental health. Like, there's, that's a, that is a farce. That is not a thing. Like, you can have a good day. You can have a bad day. There's no, and mental health is not something you can actually ever achieve because life isn't like that. It ebbs and flows, and so will your mental health. So I think what I focus on more than anything is, like, learning how to create a mental health toolkit that you, like, are things that you know, like, these are things I go to. When I feel this way, and if these things don't work, this is my next my next level of things. And you know, these are the people I reach out to, and like you know, just kind of knowing 
knowing yourself, but I, I don't believe mental health is, I think it's marketed a lot as something that like we need to achieve and it's not. Well, unfortunately, everything in the end or, or, you know, anything can be marketed for a profit. Right. So there's always that aspect of things too, you know, and, and the self-help, but I have personally, I think like many, many people have gotten a lot out of, you know, certain self-help books and, and things like that. I love books. Yeah. We need it. I think it's important. You know, you need to uplift yourself and see the positive side of things. I love, I love all things self-help and wellness. Like I am the first person that will buy the body oil that makes you feel like extra calm or like extra, like I am, so, I get got by wellness marketing all the time. And then you turn but, around and go play a really dark minor key Beethoven sonata. With absolutely. The balance. But that's no part of it. I, I think some, like having the awareness that like you can be both. <laughs> You can like all the wellness stuff and also have bad days. A hundred percent. Or at your mental health. We're going to finish up your videos. We're going to finish up your songs and videos. I just side note, I got to say, Vic, this is the most badass I've ever looked on this podcast. It is. Like, yeah. I was noticing that. Yeah. I look so wicked right now. So normally I have a light on and then I have this little side light that's just put, but then like I didn't turn the light on the sun's it's gone. So me. it's super dark. And now I've just become like this yeah. goth head over here. I feel like I'm in one of your videos, like some cool. It's nice and effect. Oh, so you can watch your yeah. back then. <laughs> <laughs> cold and bloody uh no but anyway um and i'm not going to get up and turn out the live on the light because it just looks cool so screw it but let's see let's see if i can resume here and you're not wearing pants um, either probably now come on vic we're we're enough past co not granted i didn't i didn't wear pants for good uh, i wore my bob ross j p pajama pants for a good two years straight during covid just teaching online and stuff you know why bother putting on jeans i have no I don't want to have anything. I got to be comfortable, but that's another topic. <laughs> Where were we? I, we? We talked about crash landing. So now we're coming to you. Well, we'll get to London, but you got a couple of uh, a couple of cover songs. Really uh, fantastic cover songs. Taint, tainted love. Tainted love. Tell us uh, how that came about. Um, well, over COVID, I like when I wasn't really wanting to put out more songs from the record until I had kind of figured out what was happening in the world. I still wanted to put out some music, so we decided to do a couple of fun covers and each band member picked a cover that they wanted to see us do. So, um, yeah, Team Love was my old guitarist choice, and we wanted to make a really dark, uh, a dark rock version of it. Kind of, um, I, I think we were more inspired by the Marilyn Manson version, but we wanted ah. to make it even, even darker and do a female rock version of it. I didn't even know he covered that. Oh yeah. I know he. I knew he did the Annie Lennox tune, but I didn't know he did Tainted mm -hmm. Love also. Mm -hmm. And so, there's a video for this one or no? Uh, yeah, we did like a live. Live. There's yeah. a live video, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just looking here real quick. Live and a, a, video a video lyric and a video. video, too, right? Yeah, that one also had a lot of And then we did um, Hella Good. My, my drummer really wanted to do Hella Good, and we wound up doing a really fun version of that. And yeah. And we composed this really fun ending for it that uh, we added to the song, so that was really fun. Really cool version of that tune. Um, I, I don't know why... I, I the bass line is so hooky and I, I heard it and I was like oh this is a, I think this is Britney Spears and I was like oh no it's totally not it's no doubt but you know, whatever <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Britney Spears has some catchy stuff of course she does Britney Spears was actually my first concert was it great Circus. inspirational it was Here's my thing with Britney Spears. Because, I mean, as, all right, I mean, back in the day, I'm a dude and I'm like, yeah, rock metal. And I love all kinds of music. I'm definitely not the guy now that's just like, Slayer and everything else sucks. I mean, I love everything, right? <laughs> like, if it's good, like, it doesn't matter what the genre is. But, like, you know, I think there's this thing with a lot of, like, you know, oh, I don't listen to boy bands and I don't listen to this. And I'm like, well, they're good. Like, they're, I mean, I, I mean, you might not be your cup of tea, but there's obviously professional people writing and producing this music and it's going to sound good and it's going to be hooky. That's the whole point of this sort of pop, these 
powerhouse pop genre, you know. And uh, but I remember for me with Britney Spears, of course, like uh, everybody had heard the Oops, I did it again, and all that, of course. But I remember, do you know the movie? Uh, I love this movie; it's so good. Uh, Bridesmaids. Do you know that movie? <laughs> There's the part on the plane. Or what's her name? Kristen yeah. Wiig gets kicked off the plane. She's all drunk and everything. And they start playing yeah. that Britney Spears. And I didn't know what it was. And I was like, that song's badass. What is that? And then yeah. I like found out it was Britney Spears. And I was kind of like, oh, well, I like Britney, Britney. Spears. <laughs> I guess I like it. <laughs> Britney has hard. And she's a badass performer. And I think I think with a lot of a lot of pop stars like that. She's a great performer, and there there is something that all of them are great for. It may not be the best vocalist in the world, but that's not like that's no, not you're what right. She's there for. It's yes, not like that's her gift, and a lot of them aren't. Like a lot of them are playing tracks, and that's fine. Like that's they're great performers, regardless. Yeah, hundred percent, and that's what you're there for. You're watching the show. I'm not Madonna, arguably probably not the greatest vocalist, but you know, revolutionary performer. Entertainer. Yep, great entertainer. <laughs> not everybody can be Lady Gaga and just have the full package, right? Are you a Lady Gaga fan? No? Not really. Oh, wow. Who are some of your favorites? What We didn't even talk about. Like, what are some of your big influences in terms of, like, pop or just, you know, outside of the classical opera, classical zone, like, you know, vocalist or bands or whatever? Like, who are some yeah. of your big influences? I listen to... I love, I love Kate Bush forever. I think it's hilarious that she's having such a resurgence. Oh, now. yeah. Her and her Metallica. Her, yeah. <laughs> She's always been one of my favorites. And um, Annie Lennox and Pat Benatar and all the great new sure. vocalists of the 80s. Uh, when power vocals were really shining. Yeah. Um, it was surprise, surprise, but I love that. <laughs> um I, um, it was before the whisper I, pop came along, right? They, you belted yeah. out your stuff back then. And then all the, uh, and Yeah, I whisper pop like, and auto tune. Yeah. I can't even tell you how many producers and label people have told me, can you sing with like some less vibrato, maybe less strong, more straight tone? And I'm like, yeah, that's not how I sing. That's not my voice. It's not what I'm interested in. Like, <laughs> no. Um, but, you know, I love all the power females from back then. I also love Queen. And Radiohead and Nine Inch Nails and um, Muse and Coldplay. I really love Coldplay. Maybe that's lame of me, but I think they're fucking brilliant, especially the early stuff. And, I, you know, the late stuff, I kind of feel like they've sold out a little bit. But earlier Coldplay records. I'll be honest, I don't really know Coldplay's catalog, but they did something right because they're freaking huge. Every band you mention, though, I'm pretty much like thumbs up. Oh, right answer. To, uh, the parachute days and rush of blood to the head. And we should listen to those records. Is this is this pre clocks? Is this pre them breaking huge? Or is that before? Or is that at that time? Uh, clocks. I know, like one song. I feel like I'm blanking on which record clocks was on, but like this is still their more rock stuff. Okay. Like before they kind of towards more mainstream. I remember when um, I first discovered Muse and I was like, oh my God, because I love yeah. the classical piano element that they all, they throw in there. And I, I, think, I can't remember the song. Was it Hurricane, Hurricanes and Butterflies or something? Or it was on that, if that's a record or a song, but that was like my introduction to Muse many years ago. Before they had really blown up, I was over in Europe or in England, actually. Well, remember, those are separate, Vic. <laughs> and I was over there <laughs> and I was uh, I was just like, whoa, who is this? And then like pretty soon, like like totally blew up over here and everything, too. But uh, and Nine Inch Nails, definitely. I grew up on like Evanescence. I loved, I loved um, you know, how cool of a vocalist she was and not traditional. From yeah, she's not a whisperer. No. Um, and nowadays, I feel like I listen to all kinds of weird stuff that Derek shows me. So, like Australian, there's an Australian band called Dope Lemon that I love, and the Black Angels, they're Austin based. Mm, okay. Um, uh, we go see them all the time. I Dope love them. Lemon. Dope Lemon's awesome. Black Angels, too. If you don't know them, get stoned and put on a Black Angels record. It will. <laughs> Sweet. I just re upped my, my pot. I can, uh, I can do that. Black tonight. Angels. Dope Lemon as well. Those are both awesome. Dope Lemon sounds like a stoner name to me. Like yeah, they just are. sounds like a and stoner. We got but, one yeah, I have a question. I, Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No, no. Now I just listen to my 
playlist Derek makes, but it's all kinds of random independent artists that are really cool. And but yeah, growing up, it was a lot of 80s music. And then I, I just kind of continued with that. <laughs> I have a question. Okay. You had, so I, f- I think you said, I forget who did what, but somebody obviously picked the uh, No Doubt song. Someone picked Tainted Love. What did you pick? <laughs> so my pick was literally Running Up the Hill by Kate Bush. And oh. we we didn't ever get to it because... Um, we had started releasing music again and we weren't really focused on that. And then it was fucking hilarious when that became popular again. And I was like, damn it, I should have done it. Like it would have already been out, but I, we wound up doing like small versions of it for TikTok, and gotcha. reels. So we did a version of it, like, you know, kind of in small forms later, but yeah, that was my pick. And it's the song I've always wanted to cover. Is that the, is that the song in stranger things? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. Now I have to ask you about this. You have a Kanye West cover. What's up with that? Oh, but, uh, Is that just a live video? It's not a re- actual release, right? But you have it on YouTube. No, no it's just a live video. Um, when I I played two shows with this Danish artist who land in New York in 2012 and. I wanted to do a cover. I, I just picked Heartless. I, I thought it would be really fun to do a Kanye song and a stage ride. So, yeah, it's just not a I, crazy story to that one. I just, I just thought it would be really fun. Are you, a, are you a Kanye fan? I love Kanye. I think Kanye is one of the great geniuses of our time. And I don't get it. To explain this to me because I don't understand. Like people say he's a genius, but I'm not. I'm not finding it. Like why? Oh my god! As a producer, man, listen to his tracks and all the like things that he was so sonically like ahead of. And I, I how far back are we going with that? Because that's what I need to do. I need to go back and be fair. The right. Beginning, but like even his album with Jay Z, even Watch the Throne, like oh, their production is so great. Like I just, I don't know. I just think Kanye is one of those people who doesn't give a fuck, and he's not afraid, and he just does all kinds of crazy stuff. And I, I think he's a genius. The thing about Kanye that I, I mean, to me though, is it like, I mean, whatever, he's done it right because he's like massively ridiculously famous, but a lot of it's bad press, the whole, any press is good press, right? But, you know, and the fact that he's so arrogant and such an ass and has done all these ridiculous things and all his vocalizing, I mean, I, you could argue that I think that to me that overshadows, or at least in a lot of people's mind, whatever talent he has. And so I, I kind of wish that wasn't the case, but I mean, I guess it's, I don't know. Like I, I just don't get. It. I don't. I don't really pay attention to the media. I don't like. When you I just like his music. I just think as a producer, and I, I just think he's made some really brilliant, cutting edge stuff. I do like to be fair. Like I, I do like to not just shit on someone. Everyone might have a bad song or a bad day or a bad moment. I don't like to be, you know, to just discount. You know, you, you need to be fair and listen to an artist's catalog. I, I, I think that part of his genius is that he has put out he has put out things that I wouldn't say are that great. But like But he tries different that, things. He tries things. Yeah. He's not afraid to try things. I can respect like that. Well he's now I guess ones. right, is he doesn't he have like he has like a kill I feel like I came across someone that plays in his band. Uh he has like some killer gospel band or some shit now, right? Don't they do like mm-hmm. church stuff and yeah. I, I don't know what's true yeah, and what's rumor, but I mean, I, I'm always looking forward to his next drop because it's going to be something interesting. I will say this, I, and I, I remember plugging this uh, when we first started the podcast, Vic, because we we had a, we talked about it with a few guests early on. Uh, I saw uh, during the when COVID first hit, I think it was pretty new. Uh, the uh, there's an, a documentary called "The Evolution of Hip Hop" on Netflix. I'm not sure if it's still there or not, but it, I would mm, highly yeah. recommend that if you hadn't seen it. Um, because like a lot of guys, like probably, you know, sort of like my, our age, like, uh, you know, Vic and I, like, you know, we, we came up with the early nineties or eighties and early nineties hip hop, the kind of, the kind of fun and innocent cheese ball eighties stuff. And then the gangster rap of the nineties. And so there's a lot of that stuff that I, that I love to this day, obviously, but a lot of stuff past that, just like with rock and everything, it's really easy to kind of like 
I love what I grew up with and everything now is shit, that whole attitude. But I don't like to be that way because there's tons of great, you know, pop music and, and there's just tons of great music out there. I personally, though, like to try to go discover the artists that aren't, you know, already celebrated and massively famous. And I, that's another thing about this podcast. I, I think, I feel like most of the stuff I listen to now is stuff that is people that I know personally have met, we've interviewed and I just love yeah, the music same. and it's fantastic. You know, um, and I'm like, Oh, this should be, this should be winning. This should be on the Grammys. You know, there's just so much great stuff out there that's that in the grands, you know, at that super high level is not recognized. But, um, where was I going with this? Um, Oh yeah, evolution of hip hop. What was really cool about that is with certain guys that I might have gotten a sort of sense of uh, that it was kind of like, nah, eh, I don't know, that's mumble rap or that's I'm not into that because maybe I, I heard one song, one thing I didn't like, and then when I watched that documentary that covered a lot of the old stuff I I love, but a lot of these newer rappers and, and hip hop guys like. I got a more of a respect for a lot of them. And of course they had a segment on Kanye and they had something on Jay Z. And I had a, a friend of mine who a musician I've played some with and I highly respect. He's always raving about Jay Z Jay Z and uh talk about Bobby Bookout, Vic. Uh he's always raving about Jay Z and uh Justin Timberlake. Well everybody loves Justin Timberlake, right? Yeah. I get it. But Jay Z, I was like, Why do you love Jay Z so much? And I went back and I know he's done this and that, and he's super celebrated. But I went back and I watched some of the early Jay Z stuff. I was like, "Oh shit, this guy's really fucking good, like a really, yeah. really good rapper." So I think it is important to do that and to kind of go back. But the Kanye thing is particularly fascinating because he has such a bad rap. And I've always so when someone, I'm always like, "Wait, Kanye." Like I said, I'm not really a words person. It'll honestly be the last thing that I hear in a song. Yeah, yeah it's I'm interesting. Like, I'm gonna feel the music first, and so for me, my love for Kanye is his production. The production, and, right? Which he is highly celebrated for, is is more uh, in the producer his, aspect. His, yeah, his brilliance as a producer. Like, I mean, I like some of the songwriting and some of his raps, but I like don't. I don't really listen to that side of it as much. It's kind of just sound to me. Interesting. So, um, so yeah, production is what I just. I love cool. Yeah. So it was that, that one. I mean, I met the no doubt single made sense, right? The other stuff made sense. I like the cover tunes. I like all the songs, I like the choice, the ones that stood out the most were the, the Panda thing, which I was like, well, now this is different. And you explained that. And then the Kanye cover, I was like, mm, Kanye cover. So th those two were the, they were, those were the ones that kind of jumped out as like the oddballs yeah. in the mix. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, Cool. Well, let's do the last one because this is the most recent one. Although you're by the time this podcast comes out, mass, uh, masquerade, right? Is that correct? We'll be out. Yes. Thank God I said it right. Okay, and then with a video, right? Every the whole package deal. Yeah, there will be a video. It'll come out in a month after the song, but okay. I was going to ask if you how you went about. Is that a typical thing that you do? Like you'll put out the song a month later to a video, or is there a method to that, or no? Yeah. Yeah, for me, it's a uh, guy. Okay, there's a lyric video. There's there's other visuals that kind of fill that space, but I try to spread it out so that I can spend more time promoting it with different different um, elements and stretching the the life of it as cool. long as I can. I just realized I don't look as cool. My fiance turned the light on, so my uh, awesome <laughs> floating goth image has been destroyed. <laughs> okay, last one. Right, let's talk about London. Tell us about this tune. What kind of dog is that? that? It sounds like a Great Dane. It sounds like a huge, massive beast. <laughs> He's definitely got something to say right now. She is very opinionated and. She has a huge personality, and lately she has been training Derek to wake up really, really early and give her chicken patties. So she started him out at like 7 a.m., and then when she knew she could get away with that, then it was 6, then it was 5, and now she has him at 3.30 getting up to feed her a chicken patty. Wow. So she, she won't even try to wake me up. She just knows he'll get up. She knows that I will not get up. Mm -hmm. And so... 3.30 right now. She's at him for a chicken patty, and then she wants to go out at, like, 5.30, and then she wants a bone around 7. So Derek hasn't been sleeping. And we're trying to figure this out because she doesn't let up. Like, she'll she'll walk on him for a bit, and if he doesn't pay attention, she'll, like, lick his head, and if that doesn't work, she just, like, will lay next to him, and it's, like, 
It's like water torture. Like she'll just take her paw and very gently tap his face until he pays attention to her. And it's like you can't ignore her. Like she just will not allow mm-hmm. it. And so she she um But yeah, she won't do been... she won't do any of this to you because she knows you'll just be like, Get the hell out of here, I'm sleeping. Yeah, she knows I won't even move. Like I'll just do that. But she's I like, I got this head. I got this dude wrapped around my finger. See, I'm the worst. Yeah. My dog, like I used to have a rot shepherd and he would do this thing where he'd have to go and poor guy. He'd have to go to you know, he need to go out in the bathroom and early in the morning be like six AM and he, I'd feel his presence. And I would just be like, oh, God, you know, and, and I could feel him sort of hovering head on the edge of the bed. And just and then, I, and then it would start like. Rrr, rrr, and I'm like, no. And then he would start barking. And that's when I was like, damn it. <laughs> but sometimes he would just I would just pretend I was asleep and he'd go lay back down. And I like, sweet. Sorry, I'm ruining your bladder, but I don't want to wake up. The funny thing I let up is that she was kind trained. I kind trained her from the time she was a baby because she used to travel with me all the time on writing trips and stuff. And so. I was like, we're going to all these hotels. Like, you're going to know how to go on the wee wee pad. And the so wee wee pad. For like nine years of her life. And then all of a sudden, in year nine, she decided, I don't do that anymore. I only go outside. So I don't know where this like mental shift came hmm. from. Like, so I'm like, oh, so you always knew how to go outside. Like, we've been trying to get you to go outside. And like, she never wanted to. Like, she would just go on her pad. And. Now, all of a sudden, she won't, won't use them. She only goes outside, and she, like, has a schedule that she likes to keep. And you can't go out of order. If you do bone before chicken patty, like, she forgets. That's because she she's it. old. Yeah. See, that's that, yeah. that, that old route. You know, you get old. You got to have your routines. You got to wake up at 4 a.m. Yeah. Yeah. Has entered the like. It's a little 70s, old lady. Yep. <laughs> she wants it the way she wants it. And. She wants to eat all the time, and that's just what she wants. Yeah, well, sounds lovely for Derek, who's got to get up at 3.30 a.m. every day. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, yeah, the Pomeranian. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how we got off on that. Oh, because you, your dog started barking. I was like, how the hell did we start talking about a Pomeranian's yeah. twilight schedule? There we go. There we go. All right, London, here we go. Lover song, and this video there's a lot of fun stuff that happens in that video. But, um, one of my favorite little little fun facts is that I made the we made the white dress out of geometry textbooks. <laughs> wow! So, that crazy big white dress, the cones are made from geometry textbooks. What the hell? Oh, yeah, you kind of see that is man, you're. Really creative visually. I would. Thank you. Yeah, this this song. Um, I kind of wrote it about like if you found your soulmate and you were like super sure of that, and then they just don't really get it and they don't really remember you and don't really feel the same way and kind of the madness that ensues from that. So, and there are, there is an Easter egg in that video. End of that video that takes you back to crash landing. I, I was told a hundred percent. I see that for sure. Yeah. Really, really cool. I'm uh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't like really dive into your videos more before we got on. I listened to the music, but man, I, I'm I'm going to be pushing the hell out of these videos for what it's worth because I mean they're they're absolutely incredible. Um. Well. Sorry all the ones i've been cooking up oh i can't wait yeah so by the time this comes out masquerade will be out and shortly after that so check out anastasia's new song masquerade and coming very soon the the new video for that so um <laughs> That's cool. You get that rock inside, right, on the live. And that's something cool, too. Even I think that's a big thing about pop acts, too, right? You listen to the music, and that's one thing. But when you go see that live, they're going to have a huge band. They're going to have the, the the drums and the guitars, and it's going to be incredible. And all the, you know, some of these great, you know, guys like Timberlake and Michael Jackson, of course. I mean, all these people, they've always had these phenomenal musicians with them. So when you see something like that, like that live, it's even 
it's just like, yeah. wow, you're seeing a production, you're seeing a show. I didn't want there to be any thing that was not analog about it. So there's no programming. It's all live instruments and even the synths we used and stuff. Damn, all. That's really cool. I love yeah, that. We brought in really it's cool all, stuff. it's all practical. Yeah, it's all practical. Um, I actually started writing this record as a dance record, the demo for Masquerade. I actually wrote Masquerade in like 2014. Um, so she's been around a while. And uh, the record spans, though, from the time I was 18 to 20, mid 20s. So the songs, like different songs, came from different eras of my life. And Masquerade was a dance, dance centric demo, um, which I probably will share at some point. Nice. But um, when we were, you know, getting to finally produce it, I was definitely inspired by by Queen a lot for this song. So. Oh, yeah. Nice. And I wrote that song on sitar, actually. That's not something you hear every day. <laughs> it's sense. Like um, a real sitar? Uh, it was sitar on a, on a keyboard. On a keyboard, but okay. Sitar. But the sound it's of it. Sitar. And so that's in the song. We're gonna hear. We're gonna hear this synth sitar. Yeah, and we brought a sitar, an actual one. Oh wow! Damn. Okay. Cool. Very cool. I'm looking forward to that. Um, last London question. Too, like a fun fact about London. I'm thinking about it. There's a harpsichord. The the main sound that kind of starts the song and stuff is the harpsichord from the 1800s. We brought in this really old, like, coffin-like harpsichord just for that part. And it's, it was so cool to be able to play. Like, I was working on a Bach piece at that time. And oh, that yeah? Came in and I, the actual thing that they would have played this on, and it was really fun to mess around with it. What Bach piece? Um, It was from the Well-Tempered Clavier. You know what I just learned? I'm so proud of myself because I would start and then I would just be like, oh, this is just so hard. And I, for me personally, I feel like some of the broke box stuff is some of the hardest shit ever. It just never, it just goes, it's just so hard. insane it's module. Oh my God. Mathematically insane. But it's one of those things that I think really sucks to learn. But when you're done with it and you watch your fingers, fucking awesome. Like, How are my hands doing this? Like, I'm not even conscious anymore of what my hands are doing. Like, they're just kind of going. I, it's so cool. So I, for me, it was a, one of the uh, inventions, number 13, I think, which is just such a beautiful piece. And I had started it, and um, and I just, for whatever reason, in like December last year, I was like, I'm just going to learn this damn thing, and I'm going to be real patient about it, I'm not going to get in a rush. And so I finally got it under my fingers. The real trick is the, the tempo, getting it up to tempo, right? And I actually performed yeah. it. I just did an acoustic thing and I had a piano. I was playing some pop songs and stuff in the crowd, you know, small little intimate thing, little patio gig last weekend. And they were super cool. I just played like a little classical something. Then there, someone was like Mozart. And I played like, you know, part of a Mozart piece, one of those gross, happy pieces. And then someone was like Brahms. I'm like, I don't know any Brahms. <laughs> like, <"Who> yeah. Brahms? <laughs> but anyway, then I just like, th- I just busted this thing out. And I was like, we're just going to go for it. Cause these people are cool. And if it falls apart, they got my back. And I was like, I did it. You you know, but it was so gratifying because I mean, they are those things are so hard, and I think there's. I, I'm 100 percent with you. I always really resonated with the, the the Beethoven classical meets romantic and Chopin and and that kind of stuff. And the Baroque was almost just this scary world and a little, just not quite at my style. But it was so gratifying to learn that piece. It's not something I really enjoy listening to. Like, it's not something that I want to play based on, like, oh, I love the sound of this and the feeling of this, but it's, like, such an accomplishment. Correct. Okay, let me, okay, if I sing it, let's see if you know which one it is, because I don't know which one it is. Oh, shit. Okay, let's see. I'm going to write him what it is. There you go. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Uh, I don't know. Uh, that's, the one. that's the one you 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 played on, or you, that you were working on. Yeah, that's the one I learned. That's the only one I've ever learned, and I don't know what it was. The best Bach piece, the easiest Bach piece, is that Prelude in C. You know what I'm talking about? Da 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 da. I teach that all the time because it's like an actual man. It's like the only freaking Bach piece that's manageable for crying out loud. But that I know. I mean, but I started like I mean, it's like oh my god, I learned one. Um, I always want to call them interventions because I felt it was an intervention to myself to do that thing. But it, it, like you said, like that's a good way to put it. Like from a listening standpoint, 
not as much, but my old accomplishments. Piano teacher, like I would have never learned that if I hadn't had a piano instructor at the time be like, I really feel like you should do this. Right. I would never, I would never tackle that by myself. I just wouldn't. So new idea, right? Just trying to just, just throwing stuff out, just spitballing. The bathtub box sessions, right? No pressure. <laughs> Not only do you have to worry about the uh, covering yourself in bubbles and freezing to death in a bathtub, now you just play a simple little Bach invention. No big deal. You got this. Oh my gosh! You know the cover songs actually would have been easier in the shower if I had had a little piano because doing an acapella, like it was hard to make that interesting. That's an interesting point too. But uh... at the. Uh... <laughs> At the end of the TikTok video, you can just sigh really loud. Yeah, that's it. See, you've got a lot of yeah. you got a lot of components to work with. Now you just got to figure out. You know what you could do, right? You could do this whole big production at the end of the at the end of every video. You just have the, the camera pans to Derek, and he just goes. <sighs> <laughs> my my one of my co-writers, uh, my guitarist wife actually, is one of my favorite co-writers, and she is also a brilliant singer songwriter and. Her TikTok, like she has the same pain as me. That one of her most big TikToks is my is her husband just like being an idiot. She's like, <laughs> I do this stuff, like why? Because that's what us dudes do. We act like idiots. Mm-hmm. That, well, now we know, Vic. We ever want to get someone a bunch of viral? You know, if yeah. they're if they're having problems getting viral, we just walk in the room, do something, be ourselves, which means do something stupid, yeah. I guess, and then you know they'll go viral. I'm like, Derek, why don't you work well, man, why don't you work harder at this? Just like film yourself doing things. That'll help us out. <laughs> and put my song on it. So it at least goes back to something. You guys go to bed arguing about who's gonna do the next day's TikTok video. He gets fifteen minutes of sleep and then the Palmeranian's waking him up for her chicken patty. Right? No, he's been desperately trying to find me the right TikTok help so that I don't have to uh, be needing his help. <laughs> right. Well he doesn't want to have anything to do with the TikTok. Well, uh, Anastasia, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. I think uh, just really have, love your music. The, the care you put into it, it really comes through both in the, the, the music itself and then the music videos, which I'm just like honestly floored by. So I'm really glad you were able to make time. And this was a lot of fun. I had a great time chatting with you. People can find you. I believe it's a dot .com, right? The Anastasia Elliot dot .com. Yep. Including TikTok. Yep. All the spots. And say that again. Oh, spelling. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, cool. The spelling is important. Anastasia Elliott, everybody. Um, oh, shit. So, whatever. Elliot. Well, I, I like the way we. Yeah. See, Vic and I, I feel like we, we had a pretty good podcast, but clearly we do not know how to start or finish the damn things, right? Yeah, we never do. One yeah. of these days, maybe by the 100th episode, we'll see. Maybe. Masquerade. Oh, no, it'll be out. It'll be out. Don't freeze it. Just go save it. Yes. Mas- no, the song Masquerade. Go listen to Masquerade, the latest single, and keep an eye out for the upcoming music video, which will blow your mind. We already know it. And... Um, <laughs> And go Hang listen to the for a few seconds. Yeah, go yeah. listen to the purple sessions too, because that, I think that yeah. sounds super yeah. super cool. So it is, yeah. it is very nice. right. Yes. Please. And like Vic said, don't bail yet because we got to make sure this uploads. So hang out. Yeah. Anastasia Elliott, everybody. Until next time, this is Scott Manhattan and Victor Ramos with the Collective Soundtracks Podcast. Take care of yourselves. Bye. Bye. <laughs> hey, folks. That concludes another episode of the podcast. Guest links will be available in the show notes. We'd like to thank our friends at Top Shelf Music for showcasing the podcast on their site. Be sure and check them out at topshelfmusicmag.com for the latest music news, reviews, and events. We'd also like to thank the folks over at Tragging Guitars, Goden Guitars, Ernie Ball Strings, and Five Iron Woodworks. Have a great week, and catch you on the next one.